You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. I would just encourage people to be more mindful in how they think about trust. Think about, is something really trustworthy? What trust are you extending? And then make a rational, data-driven, thought-out decision. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Joe. Hello, Dave. We've got some interesting stories to share this week. And later in the show, we have my interview with Dr. Richard Ford. He's chief scientist at Forcepoint, and we're going to be talking about models of trust. And we are back. Joe, why don't you kick things off for us? I will do that, Dave. This week, my story comes from a friend of the show and my close personal friend, Graham Cluley. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Friend, mentor, colleague. Right. Stalky. Right. Yeah. All right. Go on. Go on. I've talked to him a couple times on Twitter and and been on his podcast. But (laughs) he has a story about St. Ambrose Catholic Church in Brunswick, Ohio. Okay. Uh, It's a pretty big church with 5,000 families in the community and about 16,000 members. The pastor is uh, Father Bob Steck, and he had to send out a letter recently to his parishioners. You see, they're renovating the church, and the company that they're working with is Morris Brothers Construction Company. This is how this works. When you have a church that's old, you need to renovate it, and you hire somebody. And this is actually a pretty expensive endeavor. But on Wednesday, Morris Brothers calls the church inquiring as to why they have not paid their monthly payment for the project for the past two months. Hmm. The amount they're looking for is approximately $1.75 million. Wow. Okay. That's two payments, two monthly payments that they haven't received. Yeah. So the church does some investigation and they find out that they've been a victim of some business email compromise Hmm. where someone has gotten into the the church's email system and has convinced people that Maurice Brothers has changed their banking information. Right. Oh, okay. So presumably the church was paying electronically Correct. these monthly payments. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now the FBI is involved, of course. Okay. The FBI has found out that hackers broke into two email accounts belonging to the church. They don't know how they did it, if they got in with phishing or, or did some keylogging malware distribution, but basically the staff was tricked. Yeah. Right. And this money is essentially gone because it's been a while since the money was transferred. It didn't happen like three days ago, and then they could get in. They're looking for two months of payments. So if nothing else, the first payment has certainly been completely laundered by now Wow! and is in in criminal hands. The second payment, maybe they'll get some of that back, but probably not. They're not going to get any of this back. This is a big hit to the church. At 5,000 families in the church, that's an average of $350 per family that this church has been built out of. Wow. And I wonder, I mean, it sounds like these bad guys did their homework. Sure. They must have known that this renovation was happening. They knew who was doing it. Right. And I suppose that's probably not that hard to look up. I would think maybe the church bulletin was put online and they- Oh, yeah. These church you know. bulletins are online all the time. All the yeah. news is going on. Father Steck had to apologize to his parishioners. I can't imagine having to be somebody who has to write that letter, right? Right. You know, I know you all trusted us with a bunch of money, but we've actually lost it. And I like what Graham says here. At the end of this article, he says, don't feel too superior about this. More and more, not just churches, but firms are becoming victim to these kind of attacks. Generally, people in a church don't think that they're really a target for this kind of attack. Right. Because who would attack a church? Right. Yeah. What kind of a monster would attack a church? Well, these guys don't have any kind of scruples. They really don't care where their money comes from. They're stealing money. They'll they'll steal it from a church just as well as they'll steal it from somebody else. So it's really not something you can discount. You have to think about this, that you have to always have an adversarial mindset whenever you're talking about money. It's a shame. Uh, Yeah, it is a shame. But again, this is another red flag is that you have to be aware of in these kind of scams is we're changing our banking information. I'm going to go ahead and say that should be as big of a red flag as I need you to pay me in gift cards. (laughs) Right, Right. Right. When you get that message, the first thing you should think is this is a scam. Let me make a phone call and see what happens. Yeah. Never follow through with that without checking. Right. I mean, I think it's a good point, too, that don't call the phone number they provide in that that, uh, (laughs) correspondence, right? They could say, we're changing our bank account information. If you have any questions, please call me. My personal line is this. Right. No, call the number that you've been calling because chances are you've already dealt with these folks before, this vendor before or whatever it is. Right. If you work in accounts payable, 
you know the people you have to write checks to. I hope maybe they'll get some of this back with insurance or something like that. If they've been insured for this kind of attack, then there's a chance they can get it back that way. But in all probability, this money is just gone. Yeah, that yep. is a big chunk of change. It is. Well, all right, Joe. It's it's a heartbreaker, but uh, an interesting yeah, I'm, story. I'm good with the cheery stuff on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have some cheery stuff this week. Oh, good. Week. <laughs> yes, my story. This comes from the U.S. Attorney's Office from the Southern District of New York. And we've got uh, some good news. Nine defendants were arrested in New York, Florida, and Texas for a multi-million dollar wire fraud scheme. Ha ha ha. So- uh, Did they defraud any churches, Dave? Uh, not, uh, well, I don't <laughs> know. These guys, huh? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, these folks had built people out of uh, in excess of $3.5 million. And they basically went about it in three different ways. They did business email compromise, uh-huh. where they fooled uh people that, you know, exactly what you just described. Right. The second way they used what's called the Russian oil scam. Uh, I don't think that's one we've covered on our show. No, that's a new one to me. I have to look that one up. Evidently, it involved uh, opportunity to invest in oil that is stored in Russian oil tank farms. And you have to wire some upfront payments. And if you do that, then you'll be an investor in this oil field and profit. Huh. Of course, it's a scam. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and then the last category was a romance scam. Huh. That's another way to take advantage of people's feelings, emotions. So we've got nine people arrested here. Most of them uh, came out of New York, a couple of them from Florida and one from Texas. They are each charged with a count of conspiring to commit wire fraud. They could serve up to 20 years in prison. So... uh Congratulations to uh, the folks who went after them for this. Hats off to the uh, folks in the Southern District of New York. That's... Uh, I suspect uh, they probably had some help with their friends from the FBI. Yep. It says there were some folks from uh, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement to Homeland Security. So uh, lots Department of different... Treasury, maybe? But it's good to see that sometimes the good guys win. And, and I think it's good to get that message out there for the folks who are trying to do this kind of stuff that sometimes the long arm of the law will catch you and will take you in. Particularly if you live in the United States. Right. I, I think that's an interesting part of this, too, is that I think it's easy for us to think that most of this sort of thing is happening overseas because mm-hmm. a lot of it does. Right. But not all of it. Nope. And uh, in this case, the good guys were able to nab the bad guys. So uh, let's hope some of those people get some of their money back, if, even if they get some of it. It's probably unlikely they'll get all of it, but right. uh, yeah. I guess something's better than nothing in this case. All right, Joe, well, it's time to move on to our catch of the day. This week, our catch of the day comes from one of our regular listeners. His name is Todd, and Todd has actually sent us a previous catch of the day. Uh, He sent us an email. He said, gentlemen, last time I emailed, it was about the awful sextortion story that possibly led to a soldier to kill himself. Mm -hmm. He says, fortunately, this time the subject is a lot more lighthearted. Oh, good. He says, I was perusing my spam filters for anything legitimate, and I found the first attachment with a subject line like compensation. I clearly had to open it at once. (laughs) (laughs) And the letter reads like this. The subject is compensation. Dear friend. Three exclamation points. Yes. I'm sorry, but happy to inform you about my success in getting these funds transferred under the cooperation of a new partner from Vietnam. Although I tried my best to involve you in the business, but God decided the whole situations. (laughs) Here we go. Presently, I'm in Vietnam for investment projects with my own share of the total sum. Meanwhile, I didn't forget your past efforts and attempts to assist me in transferring those funds despite that it failed us somehow. Now contact my secretary in Burkina Faso. Her name is Ms. Chantal Davids on her email address below. Ask her how to send you the total of $1.45 million, which I kept for your compensation for all the past efforts and attempts to assist me in this matter. I appreciated your efforts at that time very much. So feel free and get in touch with my secretary, Ms. Chantal Davids, and instruct her where to send the amount to you. Please do let me know immediately you receive it so that we can share joy after all the suffering at that time. In the moment, I'm very busy here because of the investment projects which I and the new partner are having at hand. Finally, remember that I had forwarded instructions to the secretary on your behalf to receive that money, so feel free to get in touch with Ms. Chantal Davids. She will send the amount to you without any delay. Okay. Extend my greetings to your family. My best regards, your brother, Dr. Abu Ahmed. Greetings from Vietnam. 
my brother is not named Abu. <laughs> I, I think that was just a friendly greeting. Oh, okay. I think it was a, he was your I, spiritual brother. Not, right. Uh, yeah. I love the appeal <laughs> immediately to a religion. God, God yep. decided the whole situation. Right. Oh, this is a godly man. How could he lie? No, right? it could. Not possible. Right. Not possible. There's some odd things in this one. Uh, the whole thing about how you've assisted me in the past. Right. Uh, once again, I, I suppose... If you, because if you got this out of the blue, that sort of explains why this person might be doing this. But you may, th- I imagine a greedy person might think to themselves, well, I'm just going to play along. I'm going to get $1.45 million. At any rate, ooh, a lot going on here. Yeah. Uh, I think most uh, people would see through this one. But like we've said before, they're using these as a filtering mechanism to find the people who might be susceptible. Right. That's why they send these emails with these outlandish claims. Because if you're the kind of person who would believe it, you're also the kind of person who's likely to send money. Yeah. All right. Well, it's got a a lot of different things in here. Uh, That's a fun one. And thanks so much to uh, Todd for sending it in to us. That is our catch of the day. Coming up next, we've got my interview with Dr. Richard Ford. He's the chief scientist at Force Point. He's going to be telling us all about models of trust. And we are back. Joe, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Richard Ford. He is the chief scientist at Forcepoint. They are a security company. They focus on what they call human-centric cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be talking about uh, something they refer to as models of trust. Here's my conversation with Dr. Richard Ford. There's an old expression, right? If you want to know about water, don't ask a fish. And I think sometimes when we think about trust, it's the same kind of challenge. So in other words, trust is so woven into everything that we do that we're not really aware of how much uh, time we're spending on trust and how much effort and how important it is. And conversely, as an attacker, a lot of the time what I'm trying to do is get you to trust in something that's not actually very trustworthy. Can you give us some examples? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, we'll do a very simple one, right? Let's take the most hackneyed, sort of overdone piece of spam ever. And that's the piece of spam that shows up and says, hello, I'm a Nigerian prince and I'm trying to Mm. give you an awful lot of money. At the end of the day, what you're trying to do is get users to uh, trust that that might be real. They use some drivers like greed to go, okay, maybe I'll chance my hand at this. But again, it's sort of trying to build this trust relationships that I'll send you my bank accounts that you can then deposit, what is it, usually about $9 million or so. Uh, (laughs) And by the way, as an aside, One of the reasons those emails are so awful isn't because the attackers are stupid, it's because they're smart. Every single time somebody responds to one of those emails, it takes the attacker a little bit of time to deal with it. So they only want people to respond if they're actually going to be gullible and go all the way through. So if you make the email really obvious, you've sort of built in a filter uh, in the front end to uh, filter out all the people who'll talk to you for a bit and then go away without sending the banking details. Now, in terms of organizations protecting their networks, I mean, the, the way that we establish trust there has changed over the years as well, hasn't it? Yeah, radically so. So if you wind the clock back about 20 years, we had this sort of outside bad, inside good sort of worldview, right? That's where the whole concept of firewalls came from, is the firewall would stop you from the burning sort of mess that the internet is. And, uh, you know, your interior network could be all pristine and beautiful. Of course, over the last few years, we've seen the rise of uh, what would be called zero trust. And zero trust was, you know, created to get us away from this sort of false idea that everything outside is potentially bad and everything outside is good. And recognize instead that, you know, bad things also happen inside. And so you shouldn't just trust something based on where the packets seem to be coming from, for example. So I think we've got much more sophisticated around concepts of trust. And I think that's very much a good thing. Yeah, it seems to me like you know this old model, I, sometimes I imagine in my mind, you know, my castle with my moat and my drawbridge. And it seems like in the old days, if you thought about the drawbridge as, as your, you know, your username and password, once that drawbridge was down and I was allowed through the castle gate, well, I had pretty much free run once I was inside the castle. Yeah. And unfortunately, that mentality actually still does exist today, right? If we step back and think about many of our security mitigations, so many of them are focused on this sort of rather gross macro level perimeter around the outside of the business. I think one of the things that I see most encouraging 
in, in the industry right now is that we're focusing increasingly on micro perimeters, moving those perimeters closer to the object you're trying to protect. So you protect from somebody inside the castle as well as sort of the hordes that are outside the castle. And I think we're seeing the industry sort of growing up in this respect. I'm really encouraged by it. How is that taking place? How are these micro perimeters playing out in the real world? I would argue there's a lot of different forms of micro perimeter, right? I mean, one of the things that we do is we try and make certain that people are actually more verified in the sense that, you know, we're going towards multi-factor because if, if you're going to trust me, you better be sure that I'm me. I think there's, there's concepts around recognizing that we need to look at east-west traffic as well as north-south. So in the words, not just inbound and outbound, but internal to the company. But also, I think, you know, there's increasingly ideas around this sort of behavioral micro-perimeter. So it's not just what access does Richard have, but how is Richard using the access? And that's where the whole field of uh, UEBA or uh, user and entity behavioral analytics is starting to help us raise our game. So we're not just looking at access control lists. This is what I can do. This is what I can't. But looking at it in context. So yes, I can access this particular customer's data. But is it reasonable that I just accessed and printed out 10,000 customers' data? No, that's probably not reasonable. That's probably a symptom of something bad happening. Hmm. And I suppose, I mean, part of what you're up against here is that you don't want to increase the amount of friction that people encounter when they're just trying to do their work. Security friction is evil. <laughs> if you look at security friction, it's kind of a hill that security solutions go on to die, right? I mean, I, I like to talk to CISOs a lot. And one of the conversations we often have is, is I'll say, look, if I gave you a solution that was as good at detecting bad things as what you have today, but cause no friction, would you buy it? And the answer is universally yes. Security friction leads to a lot of very negative consequences in the environment. That's actually why I think the behavioral approach is so strong. If you make the unit of analysis the human being and you very carefully analyze how they're leveraging and using data, I think you can sort of have your cake and eat it, right? You can extend trust to the people that are trustworthy and for the people that are showing significant signs of risk. You can kind of start to deliberately introduce frictional mitigations there. So in other words, you don't have this one-size-fits-all approach to security, which does drive friction. So I think your point is very well made. Do you suppose we'll see these sorts of things trickling down to the consumer level? I know enterprises where we see this stuff today. Do you think that's something that's going to, we're going to find in our future? I think we already are seeing it, actually. So if you look at, for example, Gmail, Gmail now supports multi-factor, which is one of the tenets of sort of zero trust, right? It's pretty important to be able to verify who people actually are. There's fraud detection, which is present every single day. If you use your credit card, it's extraordinarily likely, if not a certainty, that your credit card provider is running your transactions through algorithms to detect fraud. So you've probably had that call when you've made a, a charge that's a little bit out of the normal for you, where it's your bank going, hey, did you really just buy a washing <laughs> machine or whatever right. it is? That's fraud detection. That's based on your historic purchases. How do you normally buy things? So we are seeing that trickle down already today. And I think, yeah, we'll see it more often. You have fraud detection now, even on your cell phone, potentially, trying to make certain that the purchases you're making from, say, the Apple store correspond to the things that you normally would be buying. Now, you mentioned um, of zero trust. What exactly are we talking about when we say that? Right. So zero trust is something that's been championed pretty heavily by Forrester. And what it came out of, again, was sort of getting us away from this concept of outside bad, inside good, because a lot of vulnerabilities get generated when you think of the world that way. But it's actually evolved dramatically now to say, look at a world where you assume compromise, where you assume that things are going to go wrong. Don't just radically and sort of blindly extend trust in the wrong places. Trust is sort of earned, it's built up, it's confirmed. It's much more than trust, but verify. It's assume compromise and try to make certain that in the event of compromise, the sort of damage is as minimal as possible. So what are your recommendations for folks who are going about their lives, uh, you know, using their computers, their mobile devices in an everyday sort of way? How should they approach this? How do they dial in the amount of trust, the relationship they have with the various services that they use? Yeah, so that's a really hard question, but one that I'm happy to tackle. First of all, let's talk about sort of the zero trust methodologies, right? One thing that every single user should do is up their authentication game. Right. Again, Gmail supports multi-factor now, right? You can buy a cheap little dongle that will help you authenticate in a much more secure way. And I think people don't understand, or under, that's a little bit harsh, don't understand, but I don't think they, they've sort of absorbed into themselves 
how much of a nuisance it is and how much damage can be done if you actually get your username and password compromised or guessed. So that, there's that whole side of it. In terms of trust and how they extend trust, I think we've made some progress, right? It used to be that you would believe everything that hit your inbox. And in fact, the pendulum has swung quite a long way in the other direction now. And I think that, you know, we've become quite cynical about the things that we see online. One of the places where there's still a lot of room for improvement, though, are in applications. So that free flashlight application that wants access to your contacts, that's a little bit suspicious, right? So we need to think hard about the payments of personal information that we sort of pay for things in. Because when you get that free app and it wants access to your contacts, what do you think it's using it for? Right. Right. What's the small print say? Is this data being shared? How is it being shared? It's actually very difficult out there in consumer land to sort of avoid data sharing. GDPR and a post GDPR world does give you a lot more control, assuming you're dealing with people who are trying to do it all right. So you do have more privacy control now, but there are a lot of people who are in that sort of gray space too about sort of vaguely doing things right. And you have to be a little bit more savvy. Many websites or services now give you a lot more control over your data, but most users never go in and change the defaults. Yeah, it's an interesting notion that it's worth the time to go in there and even just review them to make sure they're what you think they are. That's right. A lot of users sort of wave their hands up in the air in frustration and say, my privacy is gone. What can I do? I understand where that sort of feeling comes from. But I think that we are actually trending towards a better place. If consumers take back the power. And I think that potentially they have the, the opportunity to do that. I mean, there are some really interesting things going on in terms of technologies that can help enhance our privacy. There's the Brave browser, for example, which is actually the browser that I tend to use, which has a whole bunch of interesting technologies inside of it to try and allow advertisers to target me, as in give me targeted ads, but still protect the privacy of the person that is Richard Ford. And it uses some interesting tech to try and accomplish that. So, you know, we're seeing things trend in an interesting direction, but it'll only work when the sort of average person in the street gets more involved and takes a little bit more control. I think it's important for users to think hard about where they're extending trust. If I send you a document and you double click it and open it, you're extending some trust to me, right? Because there's some risk to you every time you open an attachment. Similarly, when you stick your credit card in to anything, really, I mean, even a gas pump, right? There's some level of risk. You have to think about the trust you're extending. I don't want users to live in a world where it's all about distrust, however. There are two ways that trust goes wrong. There's when you trust something that you shouldn't have. I think we're all very familiar with that. But there's also an example where you should have trusted something and you didn't and you miss out on an opportunity. So I would just encourage people to be more mindful in how they think about trust. Think about, is something really trustworthy? What trust you're extending? And then make a rational, data-driven, thought-out decision. Lots of interesting stuff there, huh, Joe? Yeah, that was a great interview, Dave. I like the castle analogy. Everything outside is bad, everything inside is good, mm -hmm. right? And I, I like what, what Dr. Ford says here, that security teams need to think about their domains as compromised, and that needs to be part of your threat model, hmm. right? Yeah. So let's say that I don't consider anybody on the inside of my network malicious, so they have free reign everywhere. Well, that's no good because people are going to be malicious on the inside of your network at some point in time. Well, and, and insider threats don't necessarily have to be malicious. They can be laziness or just someone can make a mistake. Yeah, actually, I'm not even talking about insider threats. At some point in time, somebody is going to compromise your firewall and get on the inside. Mm, okay, and and sure. then you have to act as if that threat exists on your network. And yes, the insider threat is also a real thing. And you're right. The, the insider threat is not usually malicious. It's usually either lazy or absent-mindedness or not even realizing what they're doing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Ignorance. Behavior is key. I like what he says. You're right. It's fine for me to look at one or two customer records, but if I'm pulling out 10,000 customer records, what business reason would I have for doing that? Mm -hmm. That's something that is not happening on a regular basis, or if it is happening on a regular basis, it's part of a process that happens at a particular time for maybe a data warehousing application and some data analysis is going on. But you know when those things are happening, right? And you know right. where they're coming from. So if you see that kind of activity coming from somebody's workstation, that should set off a red flag somewhere. Yeah. An alert, at yeah. least. 
And, and again, it could be inadvertent where right. someone, someone instead of, uh, you know, grabbing a file or two, grabs the whole folder yep. and forwards that on to someone that, that <laughs> that's something you want to keep an eye on. Exactly. Yeah. Or if somebody has a, a misformed SQL query, right? <laughs> where they- Or that. Yeah. I like what he says about security friction being evil. This was something that was kind of alien to me, and I'll share a story about it. When I started working at Hopkins, I came in with this idea about with all these other security notions, and I was wondering about why a hospital is so vulnerable to security problems. Mm -hmm. This wasn't clear to me until I was steeped in the environment. Mm -hmm. It's because cybersecurity is a secondary concern in a hospital. The primary concern is saving people's lives. Mm. You know, when people come into the emergency room, their their first complaint is, I can't breathe, my chest hurts, mm -hmm. maybe get these bullets out of me. Right. right? right. It's never make sure my data is secure. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, it's always something more important, literally more important. You are much lower on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Than, than cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So the idea was, or the, the statement that somebody told me was, if your product interferes with a doctor's ability to deliver health care to a patient, that product is out of here. Yeah. The next day. The doctors won't stand they for won't it. They won't stand for it. Yep. So he's 100% correct. And even environments where you don't have that kind of thing, like maybe in a financial environment where you're much more tolerant to the security friction, if you can lower the amount of friction, you can make a more profitable business. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's good for anybody. Yeah. And I think also that friction tends to spawn workarounds. Yes. If something's a, <laughs> a pain, then someone will figure out, a, they'll think they're being clever and they probably are being clever. Right. But those workarounds. Yeah. You make hackers out of your entire workforce. Right. right exactly. <laughs> exactly. Up your authentication game. Everybody should be using multi-factor authentication, strong passwords, and a password manager. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. If, uh, it's, if it's important to you, you right. need to be doing that. And finally, towards the end of the interview, he's talking about trust. Trust is something that's innate in us, mm -hmm. right? Who we trust. And I like the way he says trust can fail both ways. We can either trust something we shouldn't or not trust something we should. And that comes from our very human nature. We trust things that we're familiar with and we distrust things that we're not familiar with. Right. So that can be two different ways. Now, maybe that's good. Maybe something I'm not familiar with. Hey, you need to prove to me that you're doing something here in my interest, right? You know, the guy knocks on your door and says, hey, I, I'm here to sell you windows. Right. right. Immediately, right. I don't trust that guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You and I have, have discussed this before where... Everyone has their own risk level. Right. Where for me, there's a certain amount of risk that I'm willing to take where I will accept a certain amount of loss. Yes. Due to scamming in exchange for not going around distrusting everybody. Correct. Correct. And everybody has to figure out what their acceptable level is for themselves. Yes. And, and I, I have that same that same thing. Yeah. Yeah, you're and your life informs that. Is you know, it's a once bit, twice shy, right? That's yep. what they say. Yep. Yeah. Thanks to the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Our editor is John Petrick. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Our staff writer is Tim Nodar. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. 